Amanda Geard is proving herself a master of evocative triple timeline mysteries linking generations across the abandoned clues of family history. A faded photograph, an abandoned house, and a wartime mystery that might have remained buried forever. Welcome to the Joys of Binge Reading, the show for anyone who ever got to the end of a great book and wanted to read the next instalment. We interview successful series authors and recommend the best in mystery, suspense, historical and romance series, so you'll never be without a book you can't put down. You'll find this episode's show notes, a free ebook, and lots more information at thejoysofbingereading.com. And now, here's our show. Hi, I'm your host Jenny Wheeler, and on this week's show, Amanda talks about her latest book, The Moon Gate, telling a story that reaches from wartime Britain to Tasmania and back to Ireland. And she shares the timeline story that first captivated her imagination and inspired her from swapping jobs, from being a geologist in the world's far off corners to a fictional author who's immediately attracted positive reviews. Our giveaway this week is four romance freebies. For the month of September, including Sadie's Vow, book one in my latest trilogy, Home at Last. You've got a library full of great romances here on offer. You can select however many you like and download for free. And remember, if you enjoy the show, leave us a review so others will find us too. Word of mouth is still the best way for others to discover the show and great books they will love to read. But here's Amanda. Hello there, Amanda, and welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us. Hi, Jenny. Thanks so much for having me. Amanda, The Moon Gate, which is your second historical dual timeline mystery, refers to a particularly striking architectural feature in an old house in Ireland. And it's a significant feature. It has both symbolic and real significance to the story. Tell us about The Moon Gate. Thanks, Jenny. Yes, gosh, I love moon gates. They're these wonderful follies that are often found in Chinese gardens. But then the idea was, of course, pinched and went around the world with the British Empire. And so you see them in a lot of old British gardens. And they're a circular structure, mostly often made of stone or brick, but timber as well, or willow wicks. But the idea is that they separate one part of the garden from another, but They rise up out of the earth and the feeling is that to, or the mentality is that to walk through one is to be reborn. And so I really wanted to put one of these in what became called the moon gate because one of my protagonists, Grace, who's a young woman who leaves Grosvenor Square in London just before the outbreak of World War II, she travels to Tasmania, where I'm from originally, and um, she sheds her skin there. And actually the moon gates in the house there, at, at the back of the house there in Tasmania, between the small garden around the house and this wild rainforest. So she captures her own wilderness, I think. So it was just this lovely, lovely symbol I wanted to weave in. And are there any actually moon gates in Tasmania? Oh, I think there are some in some private gardens. And then here in Ireland, I really want to do a moon gate tour. <laughs> And I've been collecting a very short list of moon gates, but some people in the UK who've read the book have sent me pictures of moon gates in their nearby big houses, or a lot of people have them in their gardens now as well. They've built them from all kinds of things. I love the ones where people have taken rounds of logs and, and built them up into an archway that, that's round and then grown ivy up it. And, oh, it's all very romantic. Have you set up a moon gate tour? No, but I think it'd be a great business idea. I'm on it. The Moongate moves through three timelines, as you've mentioned, just immediately prior to World War II, and your heroine is sent off to Tasmania to avoid the dangers of the bombs, then Tasmania, and then coming back to Ireland and London. All of these places have very special significance for you, don't they? Tell us about them. They do, Jenny. And yeah, the book is a real tangled web of these places and times so just for readers out there who haven't read it yet set during the war and the 1970s and the modern timelines in 2005 most of the 1940s is set in 
the home front in Tasmania. I was born and grew up in Tasmania and studied there and my family's still there and I go back every year and I love Tasmania. But I didn't know anything about the war there at all because we learnt really at school the British side of World War II. So it was hard work finding out about Tassie during the war and the feeling there. But I can come back to that because I'll go back to your question, which was then, yes, so Tasmania and London I lived in for quite a few years on a houseboat. And the houseboat features in the book, although I've moved it, I've moved it across a couple of canals. And now I live in Ireland down here in the southwest in County Kerry, right on the Atlantic. And I wove that place into the Moon Gate. It's not such a big setting as it was for the Midnight House, but it felt like a really lovely connection to have the place, this new place that I live and love in both of the novels. It does fit extremely well. Can you remember the first dual timeline story that captivated you? Both of these books are very deeply embedded in that whole nostalgic feeling of family generational secrets. And I I share that love of those kind of stories. Do you remember the first one that captivated you? Yes, I think it was probably The Forgotten Garden. I'm sure many of your listeners and readers have read it by Kate Morton because I remember reading that. I actually listened to the audio book way back and I'm a geologist, so I was working in Cameroon out in the jungle and you'd be out all day collecting samples and long walks, sweating, come back, have your bucket wash have your food from the fire, hop into the hammock and then put the earbuds in and, or they weren't earbuds then, normal earphones and swept away to Australia and wool where she set it. And I loved, it really suited my brain jumping back and around the timelines and trying to find these little links. And I think I've read it once since in hard copy and I loved remembering and I love the little almost Easter eggs. It's probably not the quite the right word, but the hints all the way through that you pick up the next time you read it. Yeah, that's fantastic. She's another Australian writer, I think, isn't she? She yeah. is. I think she's Australia's biggest export when it comes to writing. She, yeah, she, and her writing is, wow, it's just incredible. So very beautiful writer. As you mentioned, the World War II part is set in Tasmania. And probably not a lot of people know what actually happened to anyone in Tasmania during the Second World War. Tell us about digging out that history. Oh, it was, yes, it was tough. I went back to Tassie and visited um, my family and went to the Launceston Library and Hobart Library and trying to dig out. I really love reading um, diaries and letters and personal stories. But there's not, there's not a huge... There's not a huge amount and certainly not available online as I was searching before I got back. But mum knows a Marion Sargent who's a historian there in Launceston and she was brilliant. She was so generous. She sent me memories from her own uh, father's time in, in the war and during the war. And they were a real springboard. And uh, some of these stories he'd written about, uh, the usual story of people changing their age, <laughs> boys changing their age to join up and... There's one particular battalion, the 40th, who went to Darwin and onto Timor and Daniel, he joins up this battalion. So I had real life experiences to, to hang his experience during the war on, which was incredible. And I love that because you feel like you're guided and then you're guiding the reader through those experiences too. It does give you the feeling of how vulnerable remote communities a long way from the action could feel in the war and also the vulnerability of the young men that went off with no idea at all about what they were going to, feeling drawn by some invisible thread. Did that touch you as you were working on it? It did. That sense that they were going off on this great adventure and I touched on it briefly. Grace, who's the protagonist or one of the protagonists in the 1940s, her uncle was in the First World War and you can see the way that he reacts to this sense of adventure that the young men have then in 1940, 41, 42. It was very different in Tasmania because less men joined up because there were less places. It was quite disorganized initially and they went overseas much later. They were reading about it in the newspaper. There wasn't so much the sense of imminent danger, but actually when you dig it a little deeper, you can feel that people were really afraid for Tasmania. There were always rumors of 
later in the war after 42 of sighting Japanese planes off the coast and of course lots of sightings of, of German submarines and in fact Bass Strait was mined during the war and shipping stopped for a time so Tasmania felt very isolated and people at and the Hove Run also really wanted to do their bit. Grace, who is inspired by Banjo Patterson, our famous ballad writer, she starts to write ballads about the war. And I wanted to incorporate some of the things that she learned. For example, in Launceston, they were doing a bingo to raise money for a spit um, in the UK. I, I made up this Spitfire bingo um, ballad. And so there were so many incredible little snippets there were blackouts in Launceston during all of the war and there were a lot of fortifications made as well and, and bunkers dug. So things I had no idea about before. Yes, yes. It seems like you might be attracted to wild places because it is Tasmania, which is remote enough, but you set it on a remote part of the coast in Tasmania. And I gather your father was very familiar with that part of the coast. Tell us about that family connection. Yes, my dad loved geology as I was growing up. And he's actually an agricultural scientist. So he worked in the poppy industry in Tasmania, which is a you know, huge industry over there. But weekends were, were not spent in the fields. We would go off um, into the hills with picks and shovels and go off panning. And so we might go to the northwest looking for sapphires or to the West Coast, learning the tin mining history or looking for gold or copper, not, not commercially, obviously, just to learn the history of the rocks. And all of that prospecting history really underpins a lot of the modern settlement in Tasmania. He loved all that pioneering history. And so we used to go camping and a lot of hiking in Tassie. Although I suppose at the time when I was a teenager, I was, I was probably a bit grumpy and wanted to be off to parties rather than off in the bush. But it must have really rubbed off on me because I ended up studying geology and becoming an exploration geologist. But I really love the west coast of Tasmania and that whole southwestern area of the state is World Heritage Area. And you can really hike for a long time without seeing anyone down there. And it's just magic. You live in a similar environment now in Ireland. Tell us about that. Yeah, so we're in the southwest of Ireland and it was a bit of an accident. <laughs> we were, my husband and I were in Norway because we were geologists. We were living in all kinds of places and we came here on holiday and rented a really cheap car. It was off season and we did the Ring of Kerry, which probably quite a few of your listeners might have done. It's this famous tourist route down here in Kerry and we were driving along and we came over the hill and saw this fantastic old house quite tumble down and there was a sign on the gate that said if you really squinted you could see that it was a faded for sale sign and you could just read the number so I don't know why but one of us called it <laughs> anyway in the end we viewed the place and we ended up staying and renovating it over many years and many tears <laughs> and so that was the love of Kerry started and the love of old of old houses really grew by living here, but it is very wild. The, the sandstone plunges into the Atlantic and you can get lost in the fells behind us. And it's, it is a beautiful place. That's fabulous. Look, this is your second dual time libel novel, as we've mentioned. And the first, The Midnight House, was a Richard and Judy selection. Now, for people outside of England, there's quite a lot of our audience that is outside of England. Explain mm. what the significance of being a Richard and Judy choice is? Best way to explain it is when my agent called and told me I had to sit down very suddenly because it's a big coup in the UK. So Richard and Judy have had their book club running, I think, since the early 2000s. And it was, it was part of their morning television program. And later on, I think about 2009, it became a collaboration with WH Smith. So it's now exclusively with W.H. Smith and they pick six novels every two or three months. And there are a lot of fans of Richard and Judy, so they'll buy all of them and find new writers and read outside their normal genre. It is really fantastic. There's a whole special print run done with special Q&A at the back and it's a real coup. I think it's probably the 
the biggest book club. It's the biggest heating club in, in the UK. Now, that book spent five months at the top of the UK Kindle list. Tell us about that story that it does have a similar ring to the one we were talking about, the Moon Gate. Similarities and settings and so forth. So tell us about the Midnight House. Yes, the Midnight House is, if, if your readers in, enjoy the Moon Gate, I think they will certainly enjoy the Midnight House. Again, I've taken three timelines and woven them together and there's a series of mysteries hiding between them and it centres on Ellie Fitzgerald who is a disgraced journalist who returns from Dublin to County Kerry down here where I'm living. And she learns about a an aristocrat who went missing in 1939 or 40, the start of the war, and is presumed drowned. But she discovers a letter that was written by this woman several days later. And so she goes off on a journey to try and find this Charlotte, Lady Charlotte Rathmore. And I have a, a section of the novel written in the 1950s, which links the present and the past, which is what I love to do, because I think I never like to look at a, a big incident in isolation. And so I've got the three timelines running through and a, quite a lot of the setting in, is in Blitz, London, which I really enjoyed researching, not sure enjoyed, but found fascinating researching Blitz, London and writing that setting. Great. Look, it sounds very intricate plotting, the same with the Moon Gate. How do you go about your writing process? Do you have a big timeline on the wall or how do you do it? Do you let it just fall into your lap as you go along? Tell us about the process. Oh, I wish it could just fall into my lap. That'd be amazing. I love hearing interviews from writers who are pantsers who write by the seat of their pants. I'm very envious. <laughs> these ones anyway, these Three, with three timelines, there's a lot of planning and plotting and I use Excel. Initially, I come up with some ideas and I just stick some non-fancy A4 paper together and scrawl ideas. And I generally take those out, do dot points in different colors for the timelines and then put them into Excel and on it goes until I've planned the, there's normally quite shortish chapters, but many of them, so there might be 80. 50 to 80. So I'll basically plan out the chapters in Excel and things can go awry along the way, mostly confidence wise. I think many writers, obviously we all struggle with that, the fear of the blank page, but on the whole, I stick broadly to the outline. I say that it doesn't always happen at all, but I try to stick it <laughs> broadly to the outline and that's how it pulls together. But there's always a lot of editing. My favorite bit is We've done the first draft and then weaving in some of the items and some of the letters that, that people find in the present that link to the past where you feel like you're tightening the plot. And I love that feeling. The weaving gets more and more intricate and you're really making something really beautiful then. But before you actually start writing, you do have a pretty definite outline there. I do. For example, for the third book I'm writing now, I have a 10,000 or 13,000 word outline. So they're quite big books. So obviously it's, if it were an 80,000 word book, that would be pretty significant outline. The, these books are 100 to 110 or 20,000. But I like to have a really big outline. I send the outline to my editor. And she likes to see it in chronological order. So if it were the moon gate, she would see the 1940s through the 70s and then through the modern day. But I don't really think like that. I think of it as, as you read it. So I have to pull it apart, make it chronological. And then I see a load of problems, of course. But I plan it bouncing back and forth as you read it, which I think that no one event, I want every event to to play forward into the other two timelines as well. Yeah. You've lived all over the world, obviously, in some very remote and exotic places. And you've now, at least for this time, settled in Ireland. And you identify with your Irish habituation. You said in a newspaper interview recently, being Irish is a feeling. And you seem to have picked up on that feeling. Tell us about that observation. They say here that unless your grandparents are buried in the local graveyard, you're a blow-in. I always be a blow-in and it's the same in all small communities the world over. And I refer to that term quite a bit in the Midnight House because there's a few blow-ins appear in that. But 
aside from that, always being a blow in, the community is really welcoming. And I always say to people that I love when, if I'm having a rough day at work or rough day writing or whatever, if I just give up, hop on the bike while it's normally raining. So get into the car <laughs> and drive down to the local shops, maybe five kilometers and just go in and buy a packet of biscuits. Somebody in there will make you laugh. They lift you up. They make you laugh or they'll have some comment that you'll remember and you'll want to write down because it's so Irish and carey and lovely. Um, so it's that feeling that really makes you feel at home here, I think. So we've been really welcome. We have a, a godson here. And I remember when we first moved here, we were sitting in the big old tumble down house that we were trying to renovate and we'd pulled out the windows were all rotten. We were having windows being delivered and there were no windows and we were sleeping in a tent in the house, in the rain. And a, a tractor came along the road that we'd seen go up and down the road because they all have very small fields here that they go back and forth between the animals. But this time he turned up the driveway and we raced down the steps and he upped the bucket of the dragnet and dropped a load of firewood. And then drove off. It was just a welcome present and we didn't even know who he was. And later we became great friends and actually we became the godparents for, for their son. So yes, it was just moments like that where you just feel really welcome and it's a really special community. That's wonderful. Look, turning away from talking about the individual books and a little wider look at your career, how did you transition yeah. from being a geologist to being a best-selling writer? I got two things there. I'm still a geologist and also I'm not too best-selling, but one day we hope. I, I always say book six. If I was at the pub <laughs> where all the all great things happen and um, I had a wine or two and I saw, uh, this was in Ireland, uh, of course, and I saw a, a flyer for Writers Week in the store, which is a big writing festival here in Ireland, but I hadn't heard of it. And it was on the next day, so and it, we have to drive to go to the supermarket anyway. So I thought, look, I'll hop in the car and go up there and see what this is all about. So I went up with my shopping bags and went to the library to a book launch, and I was just fascinated. I sat in this book launch. I don't think I've ever been to um, a fiction book launch before, and um, I was fascinated the story of how the writer wrote her, this particular book. And I was even more fascinated with the audience and all the people who had questions about their own writing experience. And they all looked really normal, like me. And I thought, I'm going to have a go at this. <laughs> I'm going to try this. I should say that I have always loved writing, but I never thought about writing a commercial fiction novel. So I, I went home and stuck those four bits of A4 paper I mentioned to you before together and just started planning a novel with timeline, several timelines, three, because that's what I liked to read, and with an old house and set in a place I lived. And that's where it all began, that one trip. Fantastic. But, so I'm sure you've got a very long way to go with where you're from now, but even so, it's probably not too early to talk about, quotes the secret of your success, because... Not everyone lands on Richard and Judy's list with the first book. Tell us, for people who might be in that position that you were in a few years ago, thinking about writing, what advice would you give them? What would you say you have done that's managed you to cut through? I would first, the first bit of advice is I'm going, I'm giving it now to your listeners and also to myself because I'm a bit stuck on book three is to keep writing forward on your manuscript, um, just keep going. That's what I'm going to do tomorrow morning when I get up. Even though I'm stuck, I'm going to keep going forward because I'm worried about what's behind me on the manuscript. But if you don't get to type the end on the first draft, it's very difficult to, to do anything then with that manuscript. At, at that end of things, I would say that and I'm telling myself, that would be the main thing. In terms of the Richard and Judy Pick luck is a big thing, but that was very fortunate. They get a lot of books submitted and I actually didn't know my publisher had submitted it. So I didn't know until the end round and they go through many rounds. So that was extremely lucky. But I would say also, I would encourage people, like if I can write a book, you can definitely write a book. And also I would try and get to know 
I don't actually know more than a handful of writers in person, but I went on Twitter and created a, an account and Instagram and followed writers and read their books and posted about them and cheered other people. And that really helped to create a, um, a lovely community or I stepped into a lovely community and a network. And I'd really encourage anyone at any stage, um, you don't need to be published or have written your manuscript to be involved in that community. You, you can just want to write and be trying to write. That's fantastic. Was Midnight House the first manuscript you finished? It was, yes. I'd written a couple of short stories before then and a few articles about geology, which was not so relevant, but it all counts. There was a, quite a bit of editing, but I was really just writing it to have a go. And I found that book two, The Moon Gate, was really tough, actually, really tough because suddenly I felt that I had something I had to deliver. So that took a lot longer and I had many false starts. It was pretty... It was a bit of a mission, to be honest, but the it was the first manuscript um, I wrote. I would Maybe that's also an advice for new writers is perhaps that first one really feel like you're just having a go and you, you don't have to show it to anyone. You just try and get to that, the end, those two magic words. Quite a few writers do have that manuscript in their drawer that's never seen the light of day. And I actually yes. admire that they just, they put that aside and they treated it as a practice run and kept on going. That's also sometimes necessary to do, isn't it? It is. And, and to be honest, the Moon Gate, I actually wrote it two timelines to start with. I had planned three. This is how things went awry. And it's quite a complex book. So it was tough. And I decided actually it would work well with two. And I sent it off and People liked it, med agents and editors, but they said it missed that complexity of the Midnight House. So I actually went and wrote the modern timeline over the top, but I already knew what would happen. So I, I nearly put it away. I thought, I can't, I don't know if I can face this. So it was nearly the book that went in the drawer. So there is that side of things as well that I imagine anyone out there with a book in their drawer you just never know what you might do with it in the future. Yeah. Look, turning to Amanda as reader, you say you've always been a, a fairly passionate reader. Tell us about what you're liking to read now and if you've got any current recommendations for people. I do. I've just finished People Like Us by Louise Fain, F-E-I-N, her surname. And I think this came out in 2019 and I've had it on my shelf for ages. And it is amazing. I think it's one of the most powerful books I've ever read. It's set in just pre-war and moving into the war in Germany and told from the point of view of an SS officer's daughter who falls in love with a German boy. It's done so magnificently, her arc and what she's been taught and, and how she grows. And, and Louise Fain has Jewish family history, which she wove into it. And I thought it was magnificent. So I'd recommend that. And just before that, I love Jenny Ashcroft. She's one of my favorites. She wrote this Echo of Love and set in Crete during war. I can see a bit of a pattern here. And it's very clever. She does wonderful dialogue and um, her characters are always really real. I feel them jumping from the page. So she's great. And then the other one I just read just before that was I reread I Capture the Castle, which is possibly my favorite book by Dodie Smith, which I always think is funny because of course she also wrote 101 Dalmatians, <laughs> which yeah. I think is brilliant. Um, it's such, it's a really lovely, unique um, single narration written in diary form. So it's very good anyway. It's very good. That's lovely. Thanks so much. They, they all sound wonderful. Looking back down the tunnel of time, if you had your opportunities for creative career over again, is there mm. anything you would change and what would it be? It's, it's been, hasn't been long so far, but I would say that when I wrote and got the contract for the first book, I thought, oh, God, I should have been. I always loved writing, as I said, just for myself. Maybe I should have done this, started this before, earlier. And, but actually, having been a geologist and lived in various places and my third book, Touch Wood, We Get There, it's set in northern Norway where I have spent a lot of time. Because I was a geologist, I was able to go there and do these things. 
I found that it's all fed into the writing. And so I think whatever you're doing as a, a, your career, and you may also love it, but you can do writing alongside it as well. And at any age, and, and in fact, the older you are, I, am, I would say probably the more experience you have to weave in into the words. I don't actually regret not starting earlier, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. You've mentioned this third book that's given you some problems at the moment. Tell us about your next 12 months and what you're hoping to see off, off your desk by perhaps the end of the 12 months. I'd certainly like to have this the third book well away by then, but it's going to be a frantic few months ahead of me, I think. And I, I would like to get that first draft off, off. And I, of course, have ideas for a fourth and a fifth. And ideas I find, or broad ideas are easy enough to, they come all the time. But I've got a notice board just over here and it's covered in post-it notes and each one's a bit of an idea. And I did, this is an aside, so I did, someone told me something once, which I thought was a great idea to have an Excel document or a board where every day, no matter what, you put one idea on it. And then eventually you will probably merge lots of those in, into a book. And I thought that was quite nice. And that's something I must do. But to, it, you know, the best case scenario would be this third book to write on and get that first draft done and dusted. Yes, and it's too early to have a title for that one. It is. I've got a few ideas, but I, and anyway, my titles always, I always suggest titles, but they normally change. So the midnight, actually the moon gate, I called it book two the whole way. Cause I didn't even want to give it a title. And but the midnight house was called finding Charlotte. And then for a while it was called the secrets of Blackwater Hall. And then the midnight house. Yeah. So the, I, I am setting this third book in Northern Norway on, I used to spend a lot of time on remote islands up there. I'm fascinated by occupied Norway out on the islands. So I'm setting it out there and I love that kind of, you live by nature out there. So I'm trying to capture that. And then also we've got modern day Kerry, County Kerry and Ireland, of course. So I'm going to blend um, those two as best I can. That's the plan anyway. So the, the very important question, do you enjoy interacting with your readers and where can they find you online? Oh, I love that so much. I love that. I sometimes get messages through my website, amandageard.com. And I love that because it feels very personal. But I'm also on uh, Twitter at Amanda Geard and on Instagram. I think it's also at Amanda Geard. And I also have a page on Facebook, but I'm more active on Twitter. And it's, I, I try and get back to everyone unless I missed it. So I do get back. And I love hearing, particularly when something has struck a chord or has reminded someone of something in their life or it's really is really special. I love to also write to authors. When I read a book, I love to let them know what resonated because I know how special that is to hear that. Look, that's fabulous. It's been marvellous talking. You've had a fantastic life already and I'm sure there's lots of wonderful things to come. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thanks so much, Jenny. That was great fun. Next week on Binge Reading, Loretta Chase, one of the doyens of Regency romance. She talks about getting over writer's block when you've already published 28 books and how winning an American Romance Writers Award for her latest romance, 10 Things I Hate About the Duke, just put the icing on the cake of an already fantastic career. That's next week on The Joys of Binge Reading. And remember, if you enjoy the show, leave us a review so others will find us too. That's it for today. See you next time and happy reading.